Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, academic, author, teacher, TED speaker. We're talking spirituality, metaphysics, Europe, and stepping into the unknown with Bethany Butzer, PhD. Sounds like a cop show, doesn't it? Roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So, tell me more about springtime in Prague. <laughs> well, the tourists have started to arrive in full force. I mean, they're here all year, but once the weather gets warmer, it starts to get busier and busier because there's cheap beer and cheap everything, really. <laughs> So there's lots of British bachelor parties that come. Oh, really? Prague is the destination for your your bachelor party? Yeah, because the euro goes really far here because we're not on the euro yet. And beer is cheaper than water. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so how does a girl from Canada wind up living in Prague to begin with? <laughs> um. Well... It's actually through my husband because, so my husband was born and raised in London, Ontario, but his parents are Czech. So they um, moved to Canada in the early 1970s. They escaped former communist Czechoslovakia and had a whole story around that so that they could raise their kids in Canada. So um, he has a Czech passport, Czech citizenship and Canadian citizenship. So um we always wanted to move here at, at some point, so eventually we did. I didn't realize that the Czech Republic was actually in the plan for you, because you, you've taken some turns to get there. Yeah, it, what, we, we originally always wanted to move to Prague at some point. We just didn't know when, and in it was maybe... I don't know, 2010 or something, we decided we would move to Prague, but then a position opened up for me at Harvard Medical School and it, I just, you know, couldn't turn it down. So we went there instead and then ended up moving to Prague after that. So it was, we ended up here in kind of a, a roundabout way. I see. We'll, we'll talk more a little about your roundabouts as this interview <laughs> goes on. So we've started, by the way, we're, we're uh, a couple of minutes in. Perfect. Tell my audience just a little bit about your background so they understand who I'm talking to. Sure. Well, my background professionally, I guess, is maybe where I can start. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I'm Canadian, so I was born and raised in a small town uh, just east of Toronto, and I went to school for psychology and spent many years doing research and, and studying psychology in London, Ontario at Western and ended up with my PhD. And, um, you know, from there I've done a lot of different things. I worked in the corporate world for a while. I was an entrepreneur for a while. I ended up at Harvard medical school and then eventually in Prague. So yeah, there's definitely some roundabouts in my journey, but, but generally that's kind of the, the short version of my background. Okay. What is compelling to me about you, there are several things, but in particular, I like that you have an academic background, uh, an academic approach to the world, but you also have this whole spirituality thing happening. So there's this academics wrapped up in spirituality and metaphysics, which I find really, really interesting. Yes. And that's been something that has been slow. It's been slow for me to arrive to that point. Um, because when I first got my PhD in 2008, I, I was completely burnt out and I left academia. Um, I was, you know, I, I got my PhD originally because I was really interested in science and research and loved doing research, but I got very disillusioned with the ivory tower and with the way that science was being done. And I ended up in the corporate world world for a while and in the wellness world 
teaching yoga and things like that. And then this position opened up at Harvard Medical School to study yoga in school settings. And to me, it was like my dream job uh, because, you know, I loved research and I was a yoga teacher. So it combined those things, which I thought would be fantastic. And you know, I ended up spending two and a half years there, uh, which was the beginning of kind of starting to combine some of the science with at least a little bit of the met metaphysics from the yoga perspective. And since then, really in the last two or three years um, in Prague, I didn't mention earlier, but I, I'm a lecturer in the psychology department at the University of New York in Prague. So I'm in academia, teaching and doing some research now. And it's really just been in the last two or three years that I've started to pull in spirituality into the science that I do and, and try to find ways to combine the two. Is there a resistance to that in the academic world? I would say yes, at least in the, the academic circles that I was trained in. So I attended you know, the University of Guelph is where I did my undergraduate degree and then um, Western University for my master's and PhD. And they're very mainstream universities. And, and I actually received very good education at both places. I have nothing against uh, those schools in particular, but it was a mainstream education that focused on the rigors of science in the modern way that we know it. And I was never given an opportunity to take courses in for example, topics like transpersonal psychology or spirituality. And I only found out, I mean, I tangentially knew that these topics existed, but my universities just did not offer courses in them. I, so, and, and I just thought they were unscientific because that's what all of my professors told me. So I didn't pay much attention to them until the last couple of years when these topics just started to come into my awareness more and more. I think they're generally coming into the awareness of society uh, in general and started to pique my interest and and I really have just almost been self-training and self-teaching myself in my spare time reading uh, things about transpersonal psychology and metaphysics and, and spirituality. I feel like this is happening right now like there's a movement not necessarily a movement but there's I would say definitely an awareness beginning to happen. There's as we begin to, it's weird because the more advanced we become technologically, it seems like the more people are revisiting this concept of spirituality, but it's not religion in the sense that maybe we've known it before. It seems like there's more of a movement towards a personal spirituality and it's connected to concepts of the universe and a lot of stuff that would have been considered maybe a little bit new age, um, which on the surface doesn't necessarily marry with science, but I feel like this is happening and I feel like there's a trend towards it. And so I think it's important that we have credentialed people like you beginning to explore it on a scientific level. Mm -hmm. Does that, make, does that yeah. make sense? Absolutely. And I mean, I've been shocked to find out in the last few years that there are credentialed people who have been studying these topics for decades now. And it's it's just been kind of this tangential, like peripheral movement in a way. Uh, but there's, you know, universities, most of them, of course, are in California, uh, who offer, you know, master's and PhD programs in transpersonal psychology and spirituality. And, and these people have been writing peer reviewed scientific papers for a long time. And it's like, I'm coming across this whole research field that, that I was not purposely prevented from seeing, but just that was not considered scientific during the time when I was receiving my education. And I agree with you that there is sort of something that seems to be churning and happening. Like just a few days ago, there was a study published about how increases in feelings of oneness are related to greater life satisfaction. And this study was picked up by several major news outlets and has been in a bunch of regular news articles. And I feel like maybe even five years ago, that type of a study wouldn't have gotten as much media attention. Um, I think that there, like you said, there's definitely something going on that people are 
perhaps becoming more and more aware of these topics. And I would say, from what I've read from certain, you know, quantum physicists or mathematical cosmologists or people like this who get really into the math of some of these topics of the universe, you know, the origins of the universe, they almost can't help but become spiritual. It's like they reach a certain point where it's, no longer science, like the math that they're doing is no longer science as we conceive of it. And they sort of start to become maybe more spiritual, spiritual. Some people don't like that word, but I'll just continue to use it where they are like, whoa, this is some really deep stuff that I'm studying. And and so often when I go to these transpersonal psychology conferences, you'll find quantum physicists and cosmologists who have realized that their their math can only take them so far and actually takes them into a place that is borderline spiritual. What is transpersonal psychology? That's a great question. So from my understanding, transpersonal psychology is the study of what like what is beyond the self. So like transcending or, you know, that's where the trans comes from in the transpersonal. So sure. that could be a- actually tra- self-transcendence, like people who experience, you know, moments of psychological flow or if they experience some sort of um, peak experience or some moment in nature when they suddenly feel connected to everything. And this can go all the way up to what you might consider to be enlightenment experiences. So transpersonal psychology studies those aspects of human experience, but also humans in relation to the world. So how do we become perhaps more altruistic or more compassionate or empathetic by transcending our ego and our kind of selfish desires or you know beliefs or the you know wanting to only achieve what's good for us how do we um move beyond that and contribute to our community and develop a sense of character and and those types of topics so it's quite broad um, but it generally involves you know transcendence of the self in a variety of different capacities why do you think there's an appetite for this these days this is something I could be a little bit skewed because I'm uh, I'm conscious of this and I'm pursuing this and I'm looking at this myself. So it shows up in my world maybe more than it does in other people's worlds. But as I say, there seems to be a movement. Why do you think this is happening right now? Well, first of all, I agree with you. I might be skewed as well because <laughs> these topics are always kind of coming up for me too. But I think that humanity is is coming to a place where we're realizing that our usual more selfish ways of doing things simply aren't working anymore. You know, we're destroying the environment, we're destroying each other, we're just engaging in all kinds of habits and practices that are are not sustainable. And I think when people start to get to this point, they realize that in order for our species to continue, really, we have to transcend our ourselves in a way, our self selfish or self-interested behaviors and beliefs in order to support each other and also support the planet. And of course, I don't think that everyone in the world feels this way, but I do think that more and more people are starting to realize that, and not just environmentally, but even the ways that we're working, you know, the kind of nine to five grind um, that's leaving a lot of people feeling rather empty and meaningless, you know, lacking a sense of meaning and purpose. All of this is kind of contributing to potentially our downfall. And, you know, there's a great um, author named Charles Eisenstein, whose work I follow, and he he suggests that we're, humanity is moving from a story of kind of disconnection into a story of interbeing and interconnection where we're starting to realize that we need each other in order to continue as a species. Do you think that's new? Like, because so much of the spiritual tradition that people are moving towards, whether it's Buddhism or Taoism or anything like that, is ancient. So Mm. it's almost like we're rediscovering something. 
Right. And that's actually a great point because Charles Eisenstein, he actually calls it a new and ancient story that we are moving into. It's like a story that ancient cultures had for a long time and, and just in kind of the modern, you know, the last few hundred years or maybe thousand years or so, we've been moving, we've been separating from that and that we need to actually move back to it. And what you're saying about science and spirituality relates to that as well, because we've been in this kind of materialist scientific model that sees the world like a big machine uh, and that everything is ir- is reducible down into, you know, neurons or, or physical matter in some way. And ancient cultures didn't necessarily perceive the world in that way. And, and so even within science, there's potentially movement to move back into or, or combine. It's not like we need to move backwards because we've done a lot of great things with science, but it's like we need to combine these perspectives in order to to come to a more balanced place. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's this weird evolution of technology and spirituality, and uh, it's it's very interesting to watch. But on a on a practical level, how does it show up in your life? Have you always had a spiritual practice, or is this something that you had? at some point in your life made a decision to pursue or has it always been there for you? Well, kind of like with academia, it's, it's quite similar in as far as my, you know, spiritual beliefs go where I was raised in a quite traditional, um, my parents were fundamentalist Christians. Mine too. uh, Yeah. So who really, you know, the Bible was taken literally and, and, and we went to church. I was baptized at age 16, you know, dunked under a, in a pool of water. <laughs> Me too. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my parents thought I was rebelling and so they, they wanted to baptize me, you know, at age 16 so that I would straighten up my behavior. Uh, fire insurance <laughs> and, for you. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so, and I, at that time really, uh, like I, I read, the Bible every night. I went to church with my parents. Um, my, my parents, we used to, when I was really young, like, I don't know, maybe grade four or five, we used to watch movies, Christian movies about the apocalypse and, yes. and kind of the, the book of revelations and how the world was going to end and the mark of the beast. And I, I had all of this very traditional upbringing. Wow. I, yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. Okay. So I'm, I'm jumping in, but we're leading parallel lives because I had the same experience. Oh, and wow. I even went to the University of Guelph and then to Western for crying out loud. Oh, crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. I watched those movies. I saw them too. They'd show them at church on Sunday nights and I would go home horrified because people were yeah. being beheaded after the rapture. And yes. I'm 10 over here. Like this is, this is intense. Yeah, no, I had nightmares. Like I still actually have nightmares from from some of those movies and just beliefs that I ended up taking on when I was quite young. And and I and I went to a Catholic school as well. So my my mom was raised Catholic but didn't really practice Catholicism until she met my stepdad who was um really into Christianity and that's how we we kind of got into that part of it. But even from, you know, age 5 I was going to a Catholic school, so I was you know, but I wasn't baptized Catholic, so I wasn't able to do all of the Catholic things that my friends were doing. You're an outcast. But I, yes, but I was still exposed to all of it. And then when I moved away from home to go to university, you know, at age, I guess, 18 or 19, I I very specifically remember I brought my Bible with me because I was afraid I like if I, that if I threw it away or something, I would go to hell. So I brought my Bible with me, but I, I stopped reading it and I... I moved away from that. And I guess I would say that I didn't outright reject religion necessarily, but I just sort of didn't pay attention to it. And I dove into science, like head over heels, almost as an antidote to religion in a way. For me, I was, you know, rebelling in a sense against what I had been brought up with. And it wasn't until I started to get into yoga, you know, a few years later, I got into yoga mostly to help me reduce anxiety and and stress that I was experiencing as a overachieving university student. But that's when I started to get back into what you might call spirituality by considering that there's perhaps more to this universe and that that more doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a man with a fluffy white beard sitting on a cloud above us, but that there's just 
perhaps an energy or force or just generally more to this universe than we actually currently understand. Yeah. I've had the same experience. I have, I have almost nothing to add. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the coming out of it, I mean, was it, did you have issues with your family coming out of Christianity? Not really, because my mom, I mean, if my mom listens to this, you know, I think my mom still prays for me every day that like, you know, that I will come back, <laughs> to, yeah. you know, to Jesus and this kind of thing. But, but my mom's actually been quite understanding and my stepdad too in the sense that there's there's maybe just certain topics we we kind of don't talk about or even if we do talk about it we sort of uh I don't know we in a way we almost agree to disagree she hasn't really tried to push things I mean my stepfather passed away so he's he's no longer around but she still kept you know kept up with her beliefs and and it really hasn't been much of a, a problem. I think for her, like I said, she still prays every day for me. And I think she hopes and wishes that I, I was perhaps more uh, traditionally religious. But I mean, I bought her a DVD a few years ago called Yoga for Christians. Uh, and because, you know, when she, first, <laughs> <laughs> when she first found out that I was getting into yoga, I think she was afraid, uh, you know, that I was going into some cult or this kind of thing. And, and so I, I, I got her this DVD and she loved it and, you know, practices with it regularly. And, and it's kind of opened up to the idea that I'm pursuing spirituality in my own unique way. And she seems at least to some extent to be pretty open to that. And, and I mean, when you asked about what's it look like on a regular practical basis for me, I, like really practically, you know, every morning, at least right now, every morning I meditate for 15 minutes and in the evening I do yoga for maybe 30 minutes and I also dance. So I, you know, I put on my headphones and I just wildly dance around the room. Um, so my yoga ends up kind of not looking like yoga sometimes. And I don't take any yoga classes outside of my home, but I do attend a I guess you could call it like an ecstatic dance class where it's just free dance, free dancing hippies, like just dancing all over the place. And it's the best kind of class I've ever taken in my life. <laughs> I'm trying to picture <laughs> Czech hippies. Oh, yes. There is there is a huge, like Europe, I don't know, in general has, I feel like just roots, older roots that go back to some of these, even pre-hippie, you know, like just these natural origins. And, um, yeah, this class, it's two and a half hours and it's the teacher plays a variety of different kinds of music and you just move, you can lay on the floor. You can just move in whatever way people yell and scream. It's, it's amazing. I like at some point in the class, every time I just have this huge smile on my face because I look around and everyone's just being human and and to me, that actually is, in a way, what spirituality is. It's like a return to our humanity, like actually just giving ourselves permission to be human with all of our faults and and everything. That's weird, because the way I grew up, and I suspect the way you grew up, faults are the last thing that you wanted to celebrate. Exactly. Exactly. And I found that in my professional life, even, you know, when I first started blogging and I found the blogs that got the most attention were the ones where I revealed things about myself that were the most vulnerable, like that I was the most afraid to share or the most ashamed of. And I realized that, wow, like people just want to connect with other people humans. And that interconnectedness, I think is actually quite deep. It's deeper even than just like connecting with a, with someone who shares your opinion, but you actually tap into the universal oneness or consciousness that perhaps underlies everything. Um, so that's where the kind of spirituality part starts to come into that. Talk to me a little bit about authenticity. This is a nice segue into authenticity and the authentic self, which I know is a thing that you've written about before. Mm -hmm. I think that authenticity is something like when I mentioned us almost remembering how to be human, I think that 
many of us wear masks quite regularly. And every time we're even just a little bit authentic, we remove that mask for a moment and people really see us. And, and when that happens, it creates this sense of connection that I think so many of us are lacking in our lives because we wear, you know, we might wear a certain mask at work uh, or with our family or with certain friends. Um, I know for me, say in a professional setting, I often wanted to put on the mask of like the scientific professor who knows everything and doesn't have emotions or any life, just like a robot science teacher person. And I found that as I started to be more open with, even with my students, they, there's something in them, in my students that shifts in their perception of me and even in the whole dynamic of how the class then goes after that. And of course, I don't, you know, divulge every personal detail of my life, but I, I try to strike a balance somewhere between, you know, sharing aspects of my story of how I've struggled as a student. I share with them that I took antidepressants for six years when I was an undergraduate student. And, and just you can see them or feel them kind of relax into like, oh, this professor is actually a human being. And I think that when we're authentic in that way, it does something to our interactions with other people that is very healing and that ultimately is, is perhaps why we're even here as humans is to make these types of connections with each other. It's interesting because we live in what would seem to be a very inauthentic reality right now. And I'm speaking of social media and I'm almost tired of the topic of social media, but it's weird because people are revealing more of their lives than ever, but you feel like in a lot of cases, they're still not revealing the true picture. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's so much content on social media that's curated, but it's actually curated to look natural. You know, like people will, will schedule seven days worth of posts about various seemingly kind of natural things. I don't know, like what they ate that day or blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, they're linking to a bunch of affiliate links or, you know, which everybody has to make a living. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But I think that, like I said, um, when I post things that are really, truly authentic, there's something about it that cuts through that in some way, like that cuts through the the BS of it. And And I think that when you're on social media enough, you actually can start to sense who the, the real posters are. I agree. <laughs> totally. You, you, I don't know how it, it's just because the person could have really nice photos and actually a really professional profile and still be really real. Um, so it's not necessarily that all the glossy people are fake. Um, it's, I don't know. It's just something you start to be able to sense. I think. I think you're right. And I think, if you have a certain amount of media savvy, you can see through a lot of that stuff. But for me, just thinking of your students, um, other young people, other older people struggling with their own identity and trying to place themselves in this bizarre world we've created now, how do, how do people go about uncovering their own authentic self? That is the million dollar question. And I'm paying you a million dollars for the answer. <laughs> oh, that would be fantastic. I think that the answer to that question is so unique for each person. And I think there's a combination of finding like a mentor or teacher or inspiration in some way. So I think that's part of it that, that, you know, finding, and it doesn't even have to be someone you pay for. It could just be someone you follow on social media or something, some sort of inspiration to, to guide you in, in the process. But the other, other part of it is something that I often call soul, soul work. And it's through, um, one of my mentors, Sarah Beek, who she, it's not my term. She actually came, came up with that term, I think where, and again, for lack of a better word, sometimes people don't like the word soul, but, but I, I actually like it where it's this, like the deepest, truest part of you that actually feels the most 
natural. So often we think that when we discover our authentic self, it's going to feel like this enlightenment moment when all of the answers of the world and universe are revealed to us. But it's actually, your authentic self is like, in a way, almost kind of boring. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, that's me. Like, that's just who I am. And 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 when you hit on it, it's actually very, it feels very just normal and comforting as opposed to some perhaps, you know, awe inspiring, magnificent experience. And so I think I try to encourage people to do the activities that help them tap into that feeling, whether it's, you know, playing music or doing art or reading scientific studies, or I don't know, for everybody, it's, it's different. But the more that you can lean into those kinds of activities, the more you tap into that most basic part of you. And what I would also say is that sometimes that authentic soul part feels scary. So sometimes it's the things that you're afraid to do or the conversation you're afraid to have that is actually the truest part of you. And when you leap over that hurdle and do that thing or have that conversation, you, you inch closer and closer to that authentic soul part of you. Why do you think people may be afraid of that? I think it's partly because of what we were talking about earlier with the masks. So with the, you know, the social structures or ideas or ways that we think we are supposed to be in the world or the ways we are supposed to work or supposed to behave. Uh, so there's, you know, we don't want to disappoint people, uh, you know, especially maybe parents or friends or loved ones. And then there's also very real financial aspects as well. You know, when you hear about people, yeah, just quit your job and follow your passion. And, you know, in some ways, that's a bunch of BS as well, because you have to put food on the table. So there's very real practical fears that can be involved too. And I think it's up to each person how they, how much risk <laughs> they're willing, how much risk they can handle, you know, their threshold. Um, for me, over the last couple of years, I've gone through various periods where I've really struggled financially based on my life decisions. And it's not easy. And it's it's a level of risk that I'm becoming more comfortable with, but I don't know if I'll ever be fully comfortable. Uh, but of course, I don't have kids. Uh, I, I do have a mortgage and, you know, I have to put food on the table, but so I can, I can risk a little more, uh, in some ways maybe than other people, but it's, it's up to each person, you know, what level of risk they're willing to take on. I can certainly see that. I, I live in the music world, so it's, it's wall to wall risk for a lot of us. <laughs> right. Exactly. So as a segue from that, talk to me a little bit about this concept of Dharma. Dharma. So the the work that you are, and work is maybe not the best word, but the work you are meant to do in the world or what you are here to do, at least that's my understanding of, of Dharma is in a way the thing that you are here to do. And many times I think this gets misconstrued as the work, like the actual profession, like you are supposed to do this job here in the world. I think that for some people, it is a job. They are meant to be a nurse or meant to be a musician or, or whatever it is. But for others, I think it, it's other things. It can be roles. Like some people are meant to be a parent. Uh, that is the Dharma they're meant to do. Uh, some are meant, and you know, this is maybe kind of controversial, but meant to maybe go through some sort of difficult illness or life event, you know, as a way to perhaps inspire or teach others. I think it can be a variety of things. It, it could be that you're meant to plant a garden in your backyard. And I think it's a wonderful, amazing mystery what it is that that garden does. We just don't know. And, it, you know, that comes back to the interconnectedness. It can be small acts or large acts. I don't think scale actually matters when it comes to Dharma. And so, you know, some of us think that we have to have this huge dharma uh, this big mission this big purpose and it can be that you help someone you help people cross the street or you you deliver groceries to elder, the elderly you know um, it doesn't have to be some grand scale dharma at least from from my perspective i knew a woman who did that with the garden 
Mm. She built this magnificent garden in her backyard because she loved to garden. And it had wonderful flowers and pathways and whatever. And it was um, it's just what she did. But people would come from miles around to look at it, you know, and she'd welcome them, walk through the backyard and take a look around. So, in fact, doing this thing she loved did have an enormous impact on people who, if nothing else, you know, could find half an hour of peace in this place that she created. Right. Exactly. And that is that relates to, you know, one of the other topics I'm interested in, which is eco psychology. And and it's related to transpersonal psychology because it's the idea of the connection between humans and nature and how often when we connect with nature by visiting a garden or or even just a green space in your neighborhood, a park or something like that, we transcend the self. It's it's you know, we, we get connected to something perhaps greater or larger than we are. And that is related to this, this aspect of perhaps spirituality or oneness or ways that we interconnect. Um, and there's again, research on this suggesting that when you spend time in nature, it's linked to greater well being. So, you know, building that garden in, in your backyard can actually be good for you and other people. You went to live in a cabin in the woods. I did. I did. <laughs> can we can we talk about the cabin in the woods? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so when I was working at Harvard, which was supposed to be my dream job, I soon realized that it was in fact not my dream job. Uh, that I was trapped in this academic system that felt stifling. That was, you know, it's obviously one of the top academic institutions in the world, and it's an amazing place to spend some time. But I knew I did not want to stay there. It was just too constrictive, constricting. And so I started to decide, okay, well, what do I need? You know, I, I tried to tap into that soul place within me and say, you know, what do I need? And all that kept coming back to me was I need to spend more time in nature. And so my husband and I had spent some time previously in northern Ontario up near Manitoulin Island at this cabin and we decided that I would, you know, quit my job in Boston and that we would go and spend two months in this cabin and then move to Prague. So we came to the decision about Prague in the way that I told you earlier. So both decisions were kind of happening in tandem and we, you know, we sold basically almost everything we owned and got a small storage locker near Toronto and then you know, I quit this job at Harvard, which of course, you know, was in and of itself a very difficult decision that, you know, people told me that I was committing career suicide and that, you know, you don't quit Harvard. Like that's just a terrible thing to do, especially to go live in a cabin and then move to Europe. Like what, what do you think you're in your twenties? Like you're not getting any younger. <laughs> this is, this is massive. Yes. Go on. <laughs> So it was an extremely difficult decision, and that's where tapping into that soul place helped me. Now, it's not like I was always strong. Like There was times when I, was, I, I had a lot of self-doubt. I was like, wow, am I actually killing my career right now? And, you know, and I'm going to be leaving my family and friends to live in a country where I don't speak the language. You know, what am I doing, really? But for some reason, that soul place was just urging me to do this. And so the two months that I spent in the cabin were amazing, just unplugging from everything. I didn't work at all. Uh, I wrote some blogs and things like that, but I, I just, I, I slept in, I didn't set an alarm. And now, while it sounds like kind of an idyllic kind of vacation, there was a lot of introspection and, and self contemplation that was going on at the same time. And so it wasn't always easy, but it was just so worth it to believe in myself enough to leave behind the mainstream structures that everyone said I was supposed to stay with um, and do what actually felt right for me. I feel like sometimes life takes nerves of steel. <laughs> it, it certainly does in music when you sit and you look at your calendar and there's not much on it and you're like, how am I going to survive? For the next two months. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Some, sometimes it just takes nerves of steel to sit in that. And I know that there will be people out there who will hear your story about quitting Harvard and going to live in a cabin in the woods. And you'll probably get backlash about that from people who would just consider that a really privileged thing to be able to do. But for me, I look at that as an incredibly courageous thing to do because you're risking giving up so much and stepping into so much uncertainty. And people aren't good at uncertainty, right? Right. No, exactly. And I appreciate you saying that. And you're absolutely right that when I did this, somehow, I think someone in the Globe and Mail wrote about it first, about this decision uh, for me to live in the, that I, you know, quit Harvard and, because it makes a good news story in a way. And, and it actually got picked up by the National Post in Canada and it started to go viral, this story. And there, there was so much backlash. There was hundreds of comments on this article saying like, oh, it must be nice to to be rich from your job at Harvard and then go take a vacation and move to Europe. And, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what people, first of all, didn't realize is that my job at Harvard was a postdoctoral fellowship that was like grossly underpaid. Like I was not making a huge salary. I was basically living paycheck to paycheck. And I had managed to save up a little bit of money so that I could not work for two months. But then I had to start working as soon as I got to Prague, which was entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial work, like what, what you're talking about. Um, uh, You know, I do consulting work that I never know when my clients are going to need me or not. And some months my income is really low and other months it's higher. But I think that on the other hand, I am privileged. I have a privileged life just to have the rights and the freedoms that I have, you know, being born and raised in Canada and being able to, to go and, and study at Harvard was a privilege. And it's not something I take lightly. I, I think that if you have privilege, it's, it's actually a responsibility to use it, uh, in, in an ethical way. And for me, you know, and in, in, with integrity as well. And for me, the decisions I've made so far with my privilege have, I've tried to make those decisions with as much integrity as I possibly can, uh, you know, for my own life, but also to perhaps inspire other people as well. Well, first of all, you earned Harvard. (laughs) Okay. I did work very hard. Yes. And you, you got your PhD, you you did all the things. You weren't you weren't at Harvard by some lucky accident. You earned that position. Right. Yes, you're right. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to mention that that you know no one in my family had ever been to university, and I I paid for all my university on student loans, and you know worked my butt off to to get to where I was. So, yeah. you know, so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> the other thing is that if moving to Europe was easy, a lot more people would do it. You know what I mean? (laughs) So people say, oh, it must be nice to move to Prague. Well, no, it's not. It's hard. And you're going into a place where that's totally unfamiliar, where you probably don't really speak the language. And, you know, people can't move to the next town over. It's too much of a challenge. How about selling everything and leaving everything behind and moving to another continent as wonderful as that continent is like people are very good at the negativity oh i know Pe- people i are, totally agree people are great at tearing down somebody who's doing something that probably underneath it all they wish they could do right yeah well and i think that that's actually you know there's a saying i've heard many times that the light you see in other people is actually your own light being reflected back to you uh, that everyone has the potential to do various things that they may want to do but sometimes when you see that light it becomes jealousy and that's unfortunate and so i hope that you know people can see the light in other people for what it is, that it's actually themselves, their own light being reflected back to them. Plus, I, I think people people never know the full story, right? Exactly. So you didn't move to a cabin in the woods on a lark. You were in a really, really hard place, right? Right. You know? Oh, yes. This, yep. this, wasn't, this wasn't a vacation. It was you escaping from something that was killing you probably, right? 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, physically I was having all kinds of health problems and emotionally I was just, I was exhausted. I was completely overworked. I was, I just spent all my time working and trying to recover from working. It it felt like that was all that I did within a system that I didn't necessarily agree with, you know, the way that the research was being done. Not that anything unethical was happening, but just sometimes I think the structures of science are so strict that, you know, people feel like they can't approach research in any other way than just the traditional ways. So I, yeah, it was a very difficult time for me. And then the time in the cabin was difficult. And the the last three, or I guess almost four years that I've lived in Prague now have also been some of the most difficult times of my life. Like some of the most, I felt the most kind of in the unknown and kind of disillusioned. Um, So it definitely has not been a walk in the park. (laughs) What have you learned from that experience living in Prague? How has it changed you? Yeah, I mean, I've learned my my, what would I call it? That my capacity for tolerating ambiguity and tolerating uncertainty and the unknown is far greater than I ever imagined. (laughs) Uh, You know, I've learned that I can't, you know, that I'm not going to die if I don't know where my next paycheck is coming from. Um, That somehow I will, I, basically that everything is figure outable. You know, I, I will find a way, whether it's that, you know, I can't, maybe I can't go to the dance class this week because I literally don't have the $15 in my bank account to go. Uh, you know, I've been in situations pretty regularly like that over the last few years. And, and so instead I'll, like I said, put on my headset and dance by myself and just find other ways to, to do what, whatever it is I need to do. So, I've I've learned and I've also learned just about how much is communicated beyond language. I, I still don't speak much Czech. It's an extremely difficult language. I can understand a bit, but I don't speak very much of it. But, you know, just through eye contact and body language, the things that people communicate with each other are are amazing. So I feel I've also become more sensitive to that as well. I drove past Prague in 2017. Right. Right. On my way to Kutna Hora. Yes. And the Bone Cathedral. Yes. And uh, I, I regret that we didn't get to go into Prague on that tour because it looks like a magnificent city. It really is. I mean, the that's, I guess, another thing that I've, I don't know if I'd call it learned, it's almost like felt, is the land here, the the old, there's a lot of Celtic kind of origins, um, you know, to the land here and the whole Slavic, I don't know, background and traditions and, and the architecture, you know, I, I've always had an affinity for all things medieval and, you know, fairies and knights and mm. all these kinds of things. And, and just all of that is very present here. And, you know, but but then you can also get, you know, people sometimes say, sometimes still think that Prague is like, I don't know, behind the iron curtain, like you can't get vegetarian food here or, you know, this kind of thing. You could get everything, everything that I can get back home, almost everything um, I can get here. And basically almost everyone under the age of 40 speaks English. So it's in Prague, like in Prague anyway, if you go out to the villages, it's a little bit different, but um, it's, uh, it's just a really, really interesting place. And I mean, even the university I teach at is the University of New York in Prague. So it's, affiliated with an American college. Um, so there's just, yeah, there's lots of opportunity here. It's, it's a really interesting place to be. I think place is important. I think there's a vibe or an energy about where you live that affects you. Absolutely. Definitely. And I've spoken to people about this. I have a lot of expat friends here who are living in Prague and they literally have no idea why, other than to say that they felt kind of energetically attracted to this place. Like for me, at least, you know, my husband, his parents are Czech, but for a lot of my friends, I have American and Canadian friends who live here and they're just like, I just needed to be here. And I even have some friends in the science world, science slash spirituality world who believe that the Czech Republic is some sort of energetic epicenter where there's just something important happening here and it's attracting 
kind of more Western scientists um, to this place. And no one really knows why, but that maybe something is going to happen. So who knows? Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. That sounds a little scary. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty intense. The the woman I met with who who talked about this, she was she was quite serious about it. And I mean, there's a lot going on in the Czech Republic with um like eco villages. People are trying to build um kind of sustainable communities, you know, interconnected communities uh kind of in the country. There there's just a lot of really interesting both from environmental, science, spirituality perspective. One of the kind of original transpersonal psychology theorists uh, was a man named Stanislav Grof, and he's Czech. And he went to the US in the 1960s. And he was involved with, what's the guy's last name? Leary, the people who were doing the LSD research at okay. Harvard. Sure. Um, uh, and, you know, back, back in the day before ethics boards became more popular. And, <laughs> you know, they eventually got kicked out of Harvard um, for this research, but he was involved in that. So there's a rich history here of like psychedelic research and spirituality and, you know, Celtic roots. And there's a lot of a very interesting vibe to this place. And, you know, maybe there is something to it that's going to eventually catalyze into something. Who knows? I feel like Europe is way ahead of North America in terms of sustainability and eco-culture and all of that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I mean, everything. I, like when you go to the pharmacy here, like what would be the equivalent in Canada of, of maybe like a shopper's drug mart and you go you can go and get your prescription for, let's say, blood pressure pills, but then the pharmacist is, is also trained in herbalism, and, and so they will also take you around, and they can offer different herbs to you, and it's just a totally, like, when I sent my husband once, I had a really bad sinus infection, and I'm like, can you go get some really strong drugs for this, like, just go find something in the pharmacy. And he came back with this like herbal, these herbal drops. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and the far, literally the pharmacist, like the one who can, who has the potential to give you strong drugs if they want, recommended this, these herbal drops. Like it's just, um, and it wasn't an all natural pharmacy. Like it was a legit, you know, medical pharmacy. Amazing. So yeah, so it's pretty neat. Yeah. I, I've spent a little bit of time in Europe over the past couple of years. And I've noticed that right away. Just, it seems like the approach to life more generally is, I don't know. I don't even know what the word is. It's, it's more, I was going to say peaceful, but that doesn't seem right. It, it just seems like everything is the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of like the future and the past, like we were talking about yeah. before. A new and ancient story. I think in Europe, because the history is older, they're still tapped in at some level to some of the older ways or traditions. And that gets blended perhaps more with the modern aspects. They're all druids. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had this experience when I lived in Japan and Japan's as ancient as it gets. Right. And you would have, this is in no way spiritual, but it's fun. You would be walking down the street and there'd be a thousand year old shrine on the corner. It'd be Shinto or whatever. Yeah. And this magnificent old mossy stone thing. And beside it, there'd be an old, old woman wearing full kimono eating a McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? This odd mix of ancient and modern. But I feel like Europe's modern is way beyond our modern. Mm. In some ways, yes. Although that story reminds me of, you know, in Czechoslovakia, when the communist regime fell and they first started getting, you know, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, and you would have almost the same kind of thing where there'd be this like gray, dusty kind of looking place that hadn't been modernized much in the last, you know, 40 years or whatever. And then people lined up out the door, like down the street to get McDonald's because it was, you right. know, modern and new and different. It was a status symbol in a way for a while at that sure. time. That's a weird world, isn't it? Yes. So I've got, I've got uh, three questions that I like to ask everybody at the end of the interview. Okay. So I'm going to ask them to you if that's okay. Sure, yeah. They're not scary. <laughs> the first question is, what are you working on about yourself these days? I would say these days I am still working on my tolerance for ambiguity and my ability to trust 
that somehow I will be supported. So in the work that I do in, and especially the personal development or soul work that I do, I, you might've seen online recently. I think that's actually why you ended up emailing me about this podcast was, you know, these synchronicities that led to me deciding to attend a retreat in Asheville, North Carolina at the end of May. And I, I cannot, I literally cannot afford to attend this retreat. Like it's not cheap. You know, I have to fly there from Europe uh, to the U S and then the retreat itself is not cheap, but there was a series of synchronicities that led to me that I just had to trust. I just put it on my credit card. It's booked the end. And, uh, and from that, some interesting things have started to happen. Like a, a woman who went to one of these retreats in the past with me, she's not going to this one, but she just decided to give me a hundred dollars to go towards the retreat. And then one of the other women who's going to this retreat started a GoFundMe campaign and it's raised, it's I think going to raise around $7,000 to help women go to this retreat. Wow. And, you know, I won't get the whole $7,000, but I might end up benefiting a little bit, you know, from that fund. And, you know, I, I, it's so hard for me to trust that I will be supported in these ways, especially for something like going to work on my soul, you know, it's like, who's going to pay for that? Like the fact that they could raise $7,000 for this, it, it like amazes me. And so I guess I would say that's mostly what I'm working on is kind of trusting, asking for synchronicities, asking for help and trusting that help will arrive, even if it's just some tiny little bit of help or that the finances I need will always come in. And even if they don't, I can ask for help or I can figure out some other way to survive basically that's a very hard thing to do faith is a very hard thing to do oh i know it's the hardest work of my life and again it sounds kind of privileged but for me like it's it's just really challenging to make like right now for example i'm contemplating potentially doing another master's degree in uh the the program is called consciousness spirituality and transpersonal psychology and of course, it it costs money to do this. And I have no idea where or if or how I will get this money. But, you know, I might end up doing it and just have to trust, which is extremely anxiety provoking, you know, but again, I'm kind of increasing my tolerance uh, to be able to handle these kinds of situations. Trust is supposed to be the antidote to anxiety. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's what I'm trying to do. Do you think the law of attraction actually exists? Hmm. I mean, when I first saw the movie The Secret, I like drank the Kool-Aid. I had vision boards. I was all over it. I had a vision board with a check on it for I forget how much money, but you know, I wanted to bring in certain amounts of income. I was an entrepreneur at the time. And I, I think I've kind of perhaps developed a more subtle or nuanced view of the law of attraction. I do think there is something to it. I do think think that like attracts like and that what you put out comes back to you perhaps but I don't think it's as easy or simple as you know I want a Ferrari and so I'm going to put a picture of it on my wall I think that it's I don't know it's deeper than that and I don't think we're always accessing it I think that you know you you kind of have to go pretty deep and release your attachment to attracting these things and then they may or may not come. I think that's the whole point is that then you, even if it doesn't come, the thing you wanted, you then learn from that and something else comes and it's actually better or different from what you originally wanted. You put a check on your vision board and wound up in the Czech Republic. (laughs) I know, I know. Well, and actually when my husband and I in, you know, years ago first decided to move to Prague, we put pictures of Prague all over our house And then we ended up in Boston, but the main picture that I had, um, was, what was it of the Charles bridge or something? There was something in the picture that I had that was from Prague that ended up being in Boston as well. So who knows, you know, these things are kind of interconnected, but not always in the way we think. I just don't think it's so explicit and obvious as movies like the secret make it out to be. The universe has a sense of humor. Yes, exactly. Question number two, what are you most excited about these days? Well, I would say I'm most excited about 
everything that we've been talking about, the the main thing that kind of clicked for me, and I actually just wrote a blog this morning that I'm going to post later today, but was an article I read recently that combined or talked about the similarities between positive psychology, transpersonal psychology, and eco-psychology. And those are three topics that I'm very interested in and am finally kind of seeing how they're interconnected. And so, for example, potentially, you know, doing this master's program, or even for me, I just, on my, in my free time, I read articles on these topics that are really sometimes kind of heavy and intense, but I enjoy it so much. I like nothing excites me more than, you know, getting a good cup of tea and reading about some, you know, eco psychology or transpersonal psychology topic. It's, it's great for me, at least right now, it seems to be what's, what's exciting me the most. That's great. That's, that's, there's so much energy in that. I can feel it in your voice. Mm -hmm, yeah. So you should follow that energy. Yes, I agree. Which leads to the last question, which is, what message do you have for my audience today? Wow. What message do I have? This well, is your chance. You know, An audience of millions. I know. <laughs> well, I think the message I have today is the message, the title of the blog that I wrote this morning, which is everything that you're searching for is right in front of you, which is the idea that we often think we are searching for some passion or purpose that is outside of us or that's elusive or difficult to get, but it's actually right under our noses the whole time. And so the example I use in the blog is these three topics I just mentioned for your last question. They've been with me since I was a little kid. Like when I was four years old, I was asking my aunt about where stars come from and what's the purpose? Why are we here? And, you know, all these really deep questions that she was like, oh God, what <laughs> this four-year-old, like, how am I supposed to answer this? Or, you know, some of my most happiest childhood memories are from time spent in nature with friends and family. And these relate directly to transpersonal psychology and eco-psychology. And so the, the, it was in me the whole time, but I studied areas of psychology that, that were fashionable or more scientific than these areas that were actually deep inside of me. And so what I was searching for was actually inside of me the whole time. And so I think that you know, we look around and around and around, but we're actually searching for, for ourselves. And to get metaphysical about it, you know, if you believe or think of or conceive of the idea that we're perhaps all actually one anyway, is that, you know, I am you and you are me and I'm searching for me and you're searching for you and we're all searching for the exact same thing, which is the transcendent oneness. Whoa. <laughs> so I would say that's, that's my message. <laughs> Well, wow, that's that's a heck of a message. <laughs> um, I'm going to link to your blog and all that stuff in the show notes. But um, for those who are listening, how can you be reached? Um, so there's my website, bethanybutzer.com, um, which is like you said, you'll link to. And, you know, email is just bethany at bethanybutzer.com. So um, it's those are those would be kind of the main places to see what I'm up to and, and to contact me. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to let you go, and thank you so much for doing this. Perfect. Thanks, John. It was a pleasure. Yes, it was, and I will speak to you again soon, I hope. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you once again, faithful listeners, for tuning into the show. If you haven't watched Bethany's TED Talk, you can find it on YouTube. If you want to know more about Bethany and the rest of my guests, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. While you're there, you might want to click on the Shows tab where you'll find that I'm going across Canada in late May and early June with my good friend Sarah Smith. Would love to see you at a show! If you're a Facebook person, you can find the show at The John Huff Podcast. That's all for this week, but I'll be back very soon. 
Until then, keep your wits about you. And remember, good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. Did you know there's an Easter egg at the end of each episode, or is it just Angelica and me? Hi, Angie.